Hey folks, this is Abel James, and thanks so much for joining us on Fat Burning Man, where we talk about real food and real results. Did you know that 9 out of 10 cells in your body are not technically human? That's right, 90% of your cells aren't human, they're bacteria. So if you're overweight, fatigued, or sick, it's time to take a look at your microbiome. On this week's show, you'll learn how to upgrade your gut health with living foods. Hannah Crum, the kombucha mama, is on a mission to change the world one gut at a time. Before we get to our interview, here's a quick update that just came in from our online community, the Fat Burning Tribe. This one's from Patty, and she says, Two weeks ago today, I had total hip replacement surgery. I have to tell the tribe that for several months leading up to the surgery, I was following the wild diet and working with a personal trainer who specializes in mobility. Since February 1st, 2016, I've lost 35 pounds of fat, 15 plus inches, and three clothing sizes. I believe that healthful eating and exercise are the keys to my smooth and strong recovery. So far, so good. I'm becoming pain-free as I've been working with physical therapy and not having an extra 35 pounds to move with is ideal. I thank Abel and Allison for the motivation and for the development of such an amazing way of life. I feel great, and I do not suffer one bit. I eat what I like. I count nothing. I don't weigh or measure anything. I don't obsess over food. I'm more relaxed, yet at the same time determined. Interesting concept. This way of life is totally working for me, and I couldn't be more stoked. Thank you, Fat Burning Tribe, for everything. Thank you so much, Patty. We wish you the very best in your recovery. We're glad that this way of eating and living is working well for you. And we're so very happy to have you be a part of the tribe. And I just want to say that, that your proof that when you take the reins of your lifestyle, your diet, and your nutrition, especially focusing on things like mobility, which really helps with longevity, all of a sudden your entire life can change. I've never been a fan of counting calories, magic fat loss potions, gyms, ab gadgets, diet foods, or other fitness industry nonsense. You really can do better without all of that. Just focus on what you're putting on your plate. Now, if you're listening and you want to share your story, hit me up at fatburningman.com. Just leave a comment there. That's my free website. Or on social media under Abel James or Fat Burning Man. And by the way, our new wild seasonal meal plans in the Fat Burning Tribe are ready and they're going to blow your mind. We'll give you instructions on how to cook the perfect Thanksgiving feast, including our all-time favorite maple brine turkey, apple pie, mini cheesecakes, and tons more. I'm drooling a little bit right now, I'm not going to lie. Uh, holidays are my favorite time of, of eating and living. But if you want to enjoy your holiday feast this year without gaining fat, that's the trick. You can get everything you need in the Fat Burning Tribe. Right now, you can join us for a discount and get wild meal plans as a special bonus at fatburningtribe.com. Once again, from any device, you can join us at fatburningtribe.com and get every recipe you'll ever need. And you don't have to get a Santa belly over the holidays. They're coming up quickly, guys. Uh, and we've had enough experience making good old-fashioned comfort food for the holidays that's not going to torpedo your fat loss results. Check out the Fat Burning Tribe at fatburningtribe.com. All right, on to the show with Hannah. You're about to learn why NASA took kombucha into space, how much kombucha you should drink, how to make your own kombucha at home, why we crave carbonated drinks, I'm definitely guilty there, and much more. Let's go hang out with Hannah. All right, folks, Hannah Crum is the kombucha mama and founder of Kombucha Camp. Their mission is to change the world one gut at a time. I absolutely love that. Hannah, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Abel. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. We were just talking about this before the interview, but you, we actually were connected about five years ago when I had one of my very first posts on fatburningman.com, and it was just a blog. I think this was well before the podcast, and I was talking about uh, kombucha. That was the first time that I was kind of experimenting with it a little bit and using it as, uh, in in a lot of cases, when I came back from my run, I would want something that was nourishing and kind of tasty, but, you know, obviously there's a big problem with Gatorade and a lot of the kind of like sports strength, the things that are marketed for that. So uh, especially back then, like, kombucha, coconut water, like they hadn't really taken off like they have now. And I was really excited about it. And you guys, um, you know, linked with your blog. And so I, I, it's such a pleasure to see that you've done so well. I have your book right here, which has been so much fun to read. You have great recipes in there from uh, kombucha itself to condiments to sourdough starters and stuff like that. I can't wait to talk about all this. But anyway, why don't we start with uh, with one of your first experiences with kombucha, I, I understand from reading your book that the first time you tried GT's Gingerade, angels started singing 
and <laughs> your entire life. Isn't that everybody's experience? Yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> for the first time, right? <laughs> <laughs> tell us about that. Well, uh, I was introduced to the word kombucha and the concept when I was visiting a friend from college. I'm from the Midwest originally. He'd moved to San Francisco. I was in L.A. We came up to visit, and he gave me this great tour around his apartment. He did all these really kind of groovy things that I'd never really considered. I was still very much standard American diet coming out of college, eating all my ramen and cereals and whatnot. So he had some really. He introduced me to some really different things, and one of them happened to be in this room on a table, there was a box in the box. There were these jars and all this floaty stuff. And he goes, that's the kombucha. Never heard of it. Had no idea what it was. And we didn't even taste it, but it was intriguing to say the least. And so when I got back to LA, of course, Whole Foods had this everywhere. This was back in the early 2000s. Um, I grabbed that bottle of ginger ale. I didn't even wait to get to the checkout line. I just opened it up right there and had my first sip. And it, it really was you know, especially in retrospect, seeing how far it's taken me, uh, yeah. a divine experience. Totally. But um, I really love that tangy flavor. You know, a lot of people, the first time they try kombucha, you might go like this, right? You right. get that little kombucha face, like, ah, oh, what did you just give me? Yeah. Um, but I was the girl sneaking the pickle juice out of the pickle jar. You know, my mom would yell at me for that. Oh, it's so salty. <laughs> yeah, my dad used to do that all the time. He'd just take swigs of brine from the fridge. Exactly. It's so good. And um, and so for me, I just I love that flavor. It really resonated. And I think the aliveness of the yeah. drink, you know, which is really even when people give you that kind of funny face, that's what brings them back around. Right. Yeah. It's it's something that's happening in your mouth that you're not quite used to for most people anyway, especially if you haven't had kombucha the first time. But uh, and, and cheers to you. Got some <laughs> kombucha right here. And yes. What's your flavor? This one right here, in honor of you, is the GT's Ginger Ale, which is one of my favorites. And um, actually, that's that's probably one of the best like post run drinks ever because it reminds me of something that's that's refreshing like that. But anyway, um, so not all of the kombuchas out there are so beginner friendly. I think that is one. GT's they do a great job. You can find them in a lot of health food stores these days. It didn't used to be that way, but it's it's really encouraging. I've seen some in gas stations. Um, Big box stores, Target. I mean, it's really exciting to see how the industry has grown. And, you know, when I first got into it, being in L.A., of course, we were lucky. We we had access to these beverages. But, you know, you go outside of um, big cities and places like that, there's no kombucha at all. Nobody knows what you're talking about. And right now, the industry is just on a tear. Right. Um, You know, in 2014, my husband and I, Alex, who I co-wrote the book with and co-founded kombuchacamp.com with, uh, we founded Kombucha Brewers International, the trade association. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you remember, it was, you know, maybe it was a little more than five years ago, but in 2010, kind of Whole Foods took all the kombucha off the shelf. They blamed it on Lindsay Lohan. I don't I know. Remember that. Bunch yeah. of drama. Yeah. <laughs> but we kind of realized that our industry was growing and was going to come into some challenges. And so we we stepped up, we volunteered, and, uh, and now we have Kombucha Brewers International with 140 members around the world. And just a real testament to how popular this stuff is becoming. And uh, what's really great, though, is all the people are like, oh, I remember that stuff from the 80s or the 90s or yeah. my grandma back in the old country drank that stuff. So, you know, the stuff's been around for a long time. It's just in this commercial form, it's really starting to take off, which is exciting to see. Right. Um, but what, the flavors are different, right? So you try some of them and it's very vinegary, you could say, right up front if they don't use any um flavoring agents or especially the ginger can cut right through that and make it taste much more refreshing I think and and if you're trying it for the first time um, it will be unique but not quite as unique as like the home brewed stuff that is nothing added to it and we've done that as well which is its own adventure and we can get into that uh, in just a second but one of the things that's that's really exciting about it is that I remember when I was on uh, the ABC TV show with with Kurt he was someone who was living in Atlanta, he'd never heard of or tried kombucha in his life, but, uh, you know, had, of course, had had sodas and sports drinks and things like that. And the look on his face when he tried it for the first time, it wasn't like puckering up the way that someone who would take a swig of vinegar would do it. It was much more like kind of, woo, uh, effervescent, excited, and this is new, this is fun, you know, and, and uh, it didn't take right away. But over the course of the next few weeks, he started to really enjoy kombucha and also the fermented coconut drinks as well, which uh, um, I've tried in other countries, which taste different there, <laughs> much more, you know, for the advanced <laughs> user once again. But, Authentic. Yeah. So what's the difference between the ones that, that people can, can drink and it almost tastes like soda 
and the ones that are much more vinegar forward that that might be more of a home brew what's what's happening in between there why do they taste so different well you know everyone can personalize the flavor based on their taste preference and that's due to the fact that it is like you keep saying it is a tea vinegar essentially is what it is mm -hmm. but where most vinegars are diluted to a five to six percent eight percent acetic acid solution kombucha is really half a percent to a percent so it's what we call like an easy drinking vinegar but because our palates are so over sugarified with the addition of all these sugars and you know chemical sugars and whatnot to our food supply, a lot of people find that vinegar flavor a little too intense. And so to help bridge folks from sodas into a healthier option, some of the brands have opted to go with lighter flavors. They've, they choose fruitier flavors to try to help ease folks into the category because once the body starts getting that nutrition in a living form, it really craves it. And once yeah. you get used to the flavor of kombucha, your palate tends to then shift to enjoy the more and more sour flavors. Because as you already know, Abel, sour and bitter are really the flavors of di digestion and health. Yeah. You know, these are the flavors that our body needs and recognize as, as being good for us in terms of digestion and making sure that we're processing our food correctly. Yeah, you can definitely feel like it's it's jump-starting something. And, uh, you know, full disclosure, I've used kombucha as a very effective hangover cure on uh, more than one occasion. Um, and that was originally actually one of the reasons that it was kicked off the shelves way back a few years ago, right? Because it does have a trace amount of alcohol in it, or at least it can. It can, absolutely. And, you know, but here's... Here's the interesting thing is, you know, humans have been consuming these, you know, traditionally fermented drinks that do contain trace amounts of alcohol that may be above that 0.5% limit, but mm -hmm. they're not intoxicating. They're not inebriating right. and they're not intended to inebriate, right? You know, yeah. who's ever sat down and tried to kill a six pack of kombucha? I mean, right. you'll probably end up in the bathroom before you yeah, can even don't, get part don't do Don't do that, by um, the way. <laughs> exactly. So, but this alcohol is our original medicine. Yeah. Right? Ancient man, this was what we put our herbs into that when we couldn't just steep them like a tisane or a tea. You, mm -hmm. you know, we put them into alcohol and that vinegar nature, that trace amounts of alcohol that would extract all that nutrition and then pass it on to you in the final product. Also, alcohol has a very specific effect on the body. It, it relaxes the system. And we all know that stress is what leads to disease, you know, yeah. whether that's stress from a terrible diet, stress from, you know, not exercising things like that, stress is really that, that root cause. Mm -hmm. And so when you have something that goes to that root cause but doesn't create that intoxifying effect, it, it's, it just makes you feel good. And, and people really enjoy that. And I think it's reuniting people with this ancient wisdom, with this ancient technology of these fermented drinks that's really contributing to this feeling of wellness. And yeah you know, a great replacement for Gatorade, a great replacement for sodas, because now instead of consuming a product that, well, it might taste good, uh, not to me, but to some other folks, right. uh, it isn't delivering any of the nutritional impact that consuming liquid refreshment is supposed to do. Yeah. And it gives you, the, the kombucha does give you a very unique boost. And I found that um, the way that I really like to use it in some cases is I'll st still drink beer every once in a while, but I used to drink it more often. You know, it's like the typical thing where you kick back at the end of the day, you have a beer. Uh, it's much better, I found, to have a bit of kombucha that way. Um, and it can also be a, a nice digestive tonic, you know, before you're eating or even after you're eating where you just have a little bit uh, a, a hit of that. And it seems to go perfectly into my day now. I, I try to get a little bit of something fermented a few times a day, and it's a wonderful way um, to, to work that into your habits. And of course, you don't have to go through the after effects of drinking something like a soda or a beer or, or what have you. You're in fact nourishing your body instead of stealing nutrients from it when when you're having something like kombucha. Um, exactly right. And in terms of the alcohol, you're, you're hitting some other really uh, vital aspects of kombucha. So mm -hmm. You know, part of what kombucha's gift to the human body is, is it creates these great healthy organic acids that support healthy liver function. And the liver is our filter. It's where we process, you know, alcohol, caffeine, prescription drugs, you know, anything that's trying to get into the bloodstream, it's got to go through the liver first and it filters all that stuff out. Now imagine if that filter gets overloaded because, you know, there's toxins in our food, you know, we're over consuming, um, whatever, whatever it is that's causing our bodies to feel out of balance. And that's all gunked up and gross. Now you start consuming something that gradually, gently gets rid of that gunk. 
just that image, I think, of a clean filter yeah. running, you know, allowing your body you just you feel so much better. And it really does have that opposite effect. I've noticed myself, my own alcohol cravings um, have reduced greatly and yeah. my desire to consume. Sure. I like to have a cocktail here or there, but I do this. I do this thing I call sneaky booch. <laughs> I'll bring in my own kombucha with me. I yeah. order my cocktail halfway through the cocktail. I top it off with my kombucha. Okay. Kombucha Rita. I like it. it. <laughs> totally. I get, and there's 24 recipes in the book if you want to make yours at home. But uh, I get, you know, I double the life of my cocktail. I yep. cut my alcohol bill in half. And like you're saying, I don't feel terrible later on. And maybe right. I can have a second one when I'm pacing it out like that as opposed to just one because, yep. you know, that's what makes my body feel good. But it's not just us humans who are benefiting from it, right? A lot of us don't realize that nine out of the 10 cells in and on our bodies are technically not human at all. They're all bacteria. So in a lot of cases, the way you feel, the way your body's working, it's really driven by the bacteria itself. And, and science is really starting to get a hold of that recently and bring it into the mainstream. But, uh, you know, the, the fermenters out there have known that for a very long time. But what are the implications there? What does that mean if, if we're nine-tenths not, uh, not human? <laughs> well, I think that, that implication is huge. And it's in, you know, really what kombucha has helped me do is view the world through a bacterial lens. Mm -hmm. And when you start to look at the world that way, because it's not just our bodies inside and out that are covered in bacteria, but every single surface, the right. smell of the rain caused by bacteria, right? You know, um, how plants uptake nutrition also bacteria. And so when you see the beauty of that and you realize there are way more quote unquote good bacteria than bad bacteria, it helps you understand that this kind of germ warfare that we've been waging is really detrimental to ourselves. You yeah. know, so FDA just recently banned tricycline or just came out and said, we, you know, those antibacterial soaps don't right. actually, they're not effective. Yeah. And in fact, they may be creating a negative effect. And so I think what it shows us is that there's a diverse world of bacteria that we don't even understand or know. You know, right. this is a whole universe that we are entering into when we go into the microbiome. And some of the interesting things they found in this research is that it's really that lack of diversity that weakens our organism, that weakens our system. And of course, we've removed people from, you know, living in dirt huts. And I'm not saying we all go back to that, but sure. you know, we we don't garden as much, we're not engaged with our world as much, and we aren't consuming these fermented foods on a daily basis. Yeah. We didn't have refrigerators except until like 200 years ago. So everybody had to engage in some form of fermentation or preservation in order to have enough food supply throughout the year. And so, you know, we've lost all of the health benefits that come from consuming those products. And so it makes sense why our bodies feel tired and depleted and why we feel so energized and excited when we're reunited with them again. Yeah. And it, it really works. Like I said before, it seems like it was something that was missing that I didn't even know was missing until I started reincorporating it. But another really interesting thing happened, which you uh, you mentioned in your book as well, where um, I, th I think you said that you started eating the, the typical junk, right? The ramen, the processed food and what have you. But once you started experimenting with kombucha and fermented foods, you noticed that that food, the typical processed food started to taste more and more like chemicals. So what happened? It's true. You know, um, when your body starts to reclaim that nutrition in a living form, it wants more of it. It's like, oh my gosh, finally, can we be done with these years of, of toxic stuff yeah. that we've been consuming? Not realizing, you know, I mean, it, we grew up at a time, you and I are similar generation, when there wasn't a consciousness that these foods were necessarily bad for us, right? right? We read the labels. They say low fat. They say healthy. They say no sugar or whatever. It's good for you. And, uh, you know, we didn't realize that these were things that were actually causing this crazy autoimmune epidemic that we see in all of these metabolic diseases. And yeah. so, you know, there were certain things that my body instinctually rejected. I don't know. How about you? Like, I couldn't drink skim milk. It was just like my body was like, no way. This is terrible. This is imposter yeah. milk. I'm not having any of it. Yeah. Uh, I, I man, I haven't milk. had skim milk in so long. <laughs> I, I can't even remember the last time, but it's been many years, maybe coming up on a decade. It was now. like blue water. Why would you drink that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, now we're realizing fat is so vital. And, of course, it tastes right. delicious. And, you know, that's why the whole milk always tasted better. Or, like, diet sodas that, you know, for me at least, that chemicaliness of the saccharin or whatever, mm -hmm. it, I couldn't do it. I know a lot of people ended up did doing it. But so there's were little hints along the way that my body was giving me information that I needed to listen to. Mm -hmm. But I still ate, I can't believe it's not butter. You yeah, know, I sure. still had 
that because that was supposedly the healthier stuff, even though I really loved eating butter. Yeah. Um, and so then when I started realizing, hi, huh, I wonder if there's other ways I can get different nutrients or different foods. And of course, being in California, I was able to experiment with vegetarianism, with raw food. And it, it was funnily enough, it was in 2010 when um, this kind of withdrawal was happening that we visited a kombucha producer in Fresno, Organic Pastures, who also happens to be one of the two raw milk dairies in California. Wow. And it was through visiting them to talk about their kombucha production that we learned all about raw milk. They introduced us to traditional foods, Weston Price Foundation, things like that. Yeah. And that just kind of shifted the course of my food journey. And, you know, I'm, I'm a German girl, Midwestern meat and potatoes. And like now I could come back and eat the meat and potatoes and feel yeah. good about that. <laughs> You know, now I try to balance how many potatoes I'm eating, right? You know, I'm, I'm conscious of my carbs and my starches, but sure. um, but it was so refreshing to kind of realize, oh my gosh, these foods of my ancestors, these foods that I instinctually crave aren't necessarily bad for me, especially when I'm sourcing it grass-fed. And mm -hmm. I have to say, grass-fed was weird tasting when I first started it, yeah, but, sure. you know, now I the corn-fed tastes weird to me. Right. So it's... You know, your body gradually, you don't make these changes all at once overnight. They gradually happen, and it's a process of exploration. But really, that innate wisdom that our body has, the way our DNA kind of, you know, look, millions, billions of years of information encoded within every single cell. And when you start to listen to the biofeedback, which I think is something kombucha really helps with. Yeah. You know, people who drink it, you can feel how it's working in your system. Right. And then you start to apply that process to, okay, so now I'm having... Um, bread. Now I'm having this other food here and I'm having that drink there. How is this making my organism feel? You start to suss out, you tease out mm -hmm. which things I should be letting go of and which things I should be consuming more of. And it's not a, it's not like, and this is the way it is forever. Right. Right. You know, we very much have that kind of dogmatic personality here in the United States. We're like, what are the rules? And now it's like right. forever. <laughs> yeah. So you allow it to be an exploration and, you know, you evolve into enjoying pate. You evolve mm -hmm. into, you know, fermented soybeans. Uh, I still haven't totally gotten into the natto, but, you know, yeah. I try it. <laughs> yeah, you got to ease into stuff like that. But once you do, it's, 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 you know, I think you said in your book, too, and I love this, one good decision leads to the next. And you find that with food as well, especially when you're retraining your, your palate. If you're trying to go from Diet Coke to kombucha, it's going to be a hard shift. But once you do that, it'll be a little bit easier next time you try, you know, one of your friends made a homemade kimchi or sauerkraut or something like that. And you try it and maybe it's not as weird as you otherwise would have thought it was if you'd just been eating, you know, cafeteria food or, or, or fast food, processed food, that sort of thing. But one of the things I love about all this is the exploration, like you said. You start to have fun with kombucha, then you try all the different flavors there and the different kinds of teas you can have and the infusions and start adding it to cocktails or what have you. Then it makes it a lot easier for you to pay attention to the things that are similar when you eat a, a fermented vegetable. And you're like, wow, there is kind of – it tastes a little bit similar in some ways. And the biggest thing that I noticed is it felt like you have more of a direct line of communication with your – gut almost right and they, they called the gut the second brain and once again science is is catching up to ancient knowledge but uh it, it feels like you're eating that something it feels like you're eating something alive or drinking something alive and and you are but but your body seems to recognize that doesn't it exactly all living beings need living things in order to to you know the sunshine is a living nutrient that we mm -hmm. need to absorb through our skin um you know consuming bacteria rich foods is another way to get that living uh, element into our body. Uh, plants convert that sunlight to make their living nutrients. So everything requires life in order to live. And yeah. um, so when I think we start to get into that and we figure out what makes sense for ourselves, that's really powerful stuff. And it, yeah. and it, and so then when your thirst outgrows your budget, right? Because now you're enjoying these things right. and you're like, but I'm spending all this Four money at the grocery you store. <laughs> That's when you come looking for us at Kombucha yeah. Camp. And, you know, I never thought I'd be putting Bacteria Farmer on my resume <laughs> like a job awesome. description. But that is essentially what we do. You know, yeah. we empower people through information and knowledge. That's what's behind the book and, and the impetus to put that out in the world. And then we also give people quality cultures, quality supplies, so that they feel empowered to do the stuff at home. Because I think you share a similar philosophy. Nobody can um, change your life for you. Yeah. You have to take the steps. People can show you a process. They can give you tips and ideas. But if you don't show up and make those changes yourself, no change can ever happen. Right. And so 
we want to give you the best opportunity to succeed at this. And that's, you know, that's guided our business model from the beginning. Yeah. So if you just want to try it. It's great to go and just grab a bottle. And and by the way, it might be $3, $4, maybe even $5 or something that something like that for your first bottle, which sounds expensive, but only compared to soda. If you compare that to a beer or wine or something like that, it's not expensive at all. And in fact, when you first have it, usually you don't want to drink the whole bottle. You'll just kind of like take a little bit or share it with friends or something. So I, I very much encourage anyone who hasn't tried it out there to try it. But if you're really strapped for cash, it's even more fun to make it at home and, and, and make it make it your own. And so uh, a few years ago, Allison and I started experimenting with making kombucha. And we made a few batches that came out great. And then <laughs> there was one particular batch where uh, two terrible things happened. One got fruit flies after a couple of weeks, which, you know, ruins it. And you, you can explain why. And then the other one got mold. And uh, we were bummed out. But... By the end of all of our, our experimentation, we had a SCOBY that was <laughs> – this thing was massive. It was talking to us by the end of it. Uh, so uh, how do people get started at home if they are interested in making their own fermented beverages? Uh, what, what's a good way to get there? Well, absolutely. Go to kombuchacamp.com. Look for our recipe. We've got a free ebook. You sign up. We give you all the information that makes it easy. And then you want to source a quality culture. So that could yeah. be from a trusted friend. You know, make sure you're getting at least one cup of starter liquid and a good size SCOBY per gallon mm -hmm. and good instructions. Of course, you can grab the recipe from our site. And if you don't have a friend or a trusted source who's doing it, then, you know, you can always call us up. That number goes right to my cell phone and I'm always happy to help answer questions or, or uh, place orders by phone. But that's really because you're going to get a lifetime supply. That little bit of investment is yeah. going to yield a lot more than just that initial cost, right? And I think, you know, we tend to focus on the bottom line because our culture really focuses on it. Right. And we've lost the sense of quality over quantity. Right. Because that's what drives consumerism. Yeah. Um, but when we start to shift that focus back to quality, we see that what we're doing is, in reality, investing into a process that's going to support our health and is going to pay in dividends that aren't, you know, aren't even financially um, accounted for. So yeah. it's, it's how you feel in the end that that really works. And that's a great way to start. And once you get started, you know, then you go down the rabbit hole. You know, yeah. the book is 400 pages. Even people who read it all through in one sitting, it's one of those books that, like, you come back to again and again. And this happened to me when I was first reading, you know, there was kind of an old work. Um, Gunter Frank, he was a German guy. He wrote a book, and that was kind of popular for a long time. And I would read his book. And I would go and I'd make my kombucha and then I'd come back and I'd read it again. And I was like, oh my gosh, these things make so much more sense to me now that I've been engaging in the process. Yeah. And again, it's that biofeedback, right? We're trained to look for the pill or the instant answer. But when we engage in that process of exchange of feedback, we really feel so much richer in that experience. And yeah. so it becomes really fun and it's a lot less expensive, right? Because once you're buying tea and sugar, that's an inexpensive cost. And I know some people out there thinking, oh no, sugar, sugar is bad. Yeah. And you know, one of the things we always say is consider the source, right? Yeah. Is this sugar coming from a, you know, a chemicalized sugar? Is it mm -hmm. coming from a highly processed corn product? Is it sugar from fruit? Is it sugar, you know, and what is the sugar for? In the case of kombucha, the sugar isn't even for you. Right. I mean, it's the teaspoon of sugar that helps the medicine go down, although, unless you like drinking vinegar. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> for the most part, it's feeding the yeast, which creates the CO2, which creates um, that trace amount of ethanol that then gets converted by the bacteria into those healthy organic acids. So that's where that symbiotic nature comes in. There's, you know, the yeast create the food source for the bacteria, but the bacteria do also consume aspects of the sugar as well. So like that gluconic and glucuronic acids mm -hmm. that are formed by that process, that comes from glucose, which is part of that sucrose molecule, yeah. right? Sucrose is fructose and glucose together. So when the yeast start breaking that apart, both of them feed on those different aspects and create what makes kombucha taste so delicious and is so good for you. Yeah, and it's it's really fun. It's like your own uh, alchemy experiment. I, I think a lot of people might not jump right on board because kombucha is just a weird word. You might not know what it is, but there's a huge difference. You know, if, if we use the beer analogy once again, there's a huge difference between like swilling a bunch of beer, uh, drinking a bunch of Coors Light or Bud Light or something like that, and brewing your own beer at home. There's, there's artistry in it. There's... Um, there's so much learning that happens, and I think more than anything else is you get this this massive respect 
for the environment and and yourself for nature right when you when you start to see that you're growing tea <laughs> you're growing tea and there are things that are alive in it that are that taste delicious or uh you know turn into a horrible mold <laughs> fruit fly experiment in some cases but the, but that is its own fun too isn't it you feel like you accomplished something when you screw it up and then you fix it again well, well you have to start well, over with you, those but <laughs> right and yeah, look it's a craft. how popular craft has become and look how we as human beings crave diversity, but we also crave sophistication. Like mm-hmm. we love to talk about our single estate coffees or our, you know, single malt scotches or, you know, insert any one of those here. And remember your first sip of coffee or your first sip right. of Lift. scotch, right? It was also one of those take you back moments. Totally. But as you cultivated the flavor for it and the appreciation for it, and I think what you're talking about too, when you do the process, there's an appreciation for why this product costs three dollars five dollars yeah. way more than soda right when you're just mixing a syrup with a carbonated water and it takes you know all of 10 seconds 20 seconds to to right. create there's not much you know artistry or whatever that goes into that and the reality is the sodas are imitation fermented drinks right like yeah we're hardwired to seek that carbonation because those bubbles indicated to us that yeast was present and right. yeast contains all the B vitamins in living form. So we have an instinctual desire craving for carbonation. Yeah. And I think that's why some people can't tolerate added carbonation because it just isn't in that natural form. Right. And, um, and they add acids. Unfortunately, their acids deplete the body of nutrition. Mm-hmm. The acids in fermented drinks, you know, replete that. Yeah. Um, and then you also have that little bit of sweetness that's there because that's what makes it palatable and makes it enjoyable. And, you know, we grew apple trees in the United States, not because we wanted apple pies or uh, apple juice. We wanted apple cider. And by the end of the week, after you juiced it, that's what you had. And this was, you know, again, this is just part of the normal human experience to enjoy these things. And, um, and then like you're saying, it's so exciting that the science now is really starting to demonstrate why it is our ancestors loved, cultivated, shared, passed down this, you know, and guarded also this wisdom and knowledge. And right. it's just exciting to see to see it um, come into its its highlight right now, because I think we really need it. You know, we're kind of at a, a crisis point in this country yeah. and a lot of people are hurting. A lot of people don't feel good out there. And there's not a lot of answers really. And, yeah. you know, the big answer is we're being poisoned in various different sure. ways. And, you know, and so it's exciting to see people kind of taking a stand against the different ways in which that is happening. But this is something that you can do for yourself really simply with not a lot of, you know, financial investment. And it really does start that whole process of getting you back on track. Yeah. And it's, I love watching kids try it for the first time too. They, <laughs> the looks on their faces are priceless, but I, I really do think that it's programming your brain for tastes later. You know, the, the sooner that you can, um, that you can try things like kombucha, sauerkraut, fermented foods, the more quickly you become human again and, and you stop eating all of that, you know, the human equivalent of rat chow that we've been fed out of the processed food system for so long. You start to wake up again and you start to realize that, um, you know, there's so much more to it than just like drinking something out of a bottle. You should be eating foods that are truly alive. And, and, and a lot of the books that have been kind of underground cult hits for a long time, Wild Fermentation. And I remember raiding my mom, my mom's uh, library. She was a herbalist and holistic or she still is a holistic nurse practitioner. And she just had all those hippy dippy books. And, you know, when I first saw it, I'm like, yeah, whatever. Kombucha sounds like a weird word. But but the more that you uh, you try it out, you take those risks and especially you start making some of this stuff at home, you start to realize that there's so much value in it and you feel so much better. And also, there are a lot of different excuses that you can come up with for reasons not to have it. It's too expensive, you know, if you choose to buy it from the store or, uh, you know, it takes too long at home. That's not true, by the way. Um, when you start making these huge batches at home, you can make it for just pennies on the dollar. You, it's, it's really cheap relatively easy to get the hang of it and then you even can become your own little scoby dealer right <laughs> you, can, you can give out pieces of scoby to all your friends and get them hooked up you can it. eat them and you can right. get them to chickens and yeah. you know kids do love kombucha they really do and i think it's because they haven't had as much exposure to all the sugary drinks and so their right. palates are ready for it yeah and you know what's kind of interesting and visibly you know is noticeable is how our lack of nutrition is manifested in 
children in mm-hmm. facial structure in these things. And <clears throat> but what's also exciting about it is how the research has shown that how quickly we can recover right. our nutrition. <clears throat> excuse me, when we go back to those really nutrient dense foods, and it's you know, it post World War II it became kind of a status symbol to have your you know your dinner in a tray right. and you didn't have to make it yourself and right bread. and so <laughs> more than just um switching out those foods we've also lost that tradition of self-sufficiency of being right. able to do things for ourselves and we come more and more victims to you know can i just press a few buttons on a microwave yeah and that's the extent of my ability to cook and it, again it's so exciting to see this resurgence in not just craft in the kitchen, but, you know, people wanting to be self-sufficient in so many different ways. And, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we go to like this Renaissance point where we have guilds and people are making crafted items and you don't buy clothes. Yeah. A year, you have one <laughs> and then you mend it and it's beautiful and amazing and this great quality product. But, um, you know, we'll see where we're, we'll, we'll see where, you know, the new world takes us, but, um, it's just exciting to see, lots of people everywhere waking up to this stuff again and coming back into alignment with this. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, another thing about, like you were saying with the beer, the difference between a Coors and something you make at home is, you know, really appreciating that process, but also consuming it in that fresh state. You know, so many of our foods in order for them to be transported long distances or to make it onto the shelf or to stay on the shelf long enough, they have to be treated or pasteurized or something like that. And that just, it really depletes the life giving aspect of it. And, you know, I often wonder if, you know, if humans consume this stuff in ancient times, none of it was ever pasteurized. And how does that, how does that difference play out in your body and how it receives it? You know, I feel like there's a biofeedback loop that ends up not being connected because you don't get the nutritional kick you're looking for. And so I think sometimes we over consume different foods or different beverages because we're not getting what it is our DNA says we're supposed to get from it. Right. Now, let me ask you this about the the caffeine content of various kombuchas. While it's fermenting, does that alter it in any way? Um, you can also use various teas. So what does it look like when someone's actually drinking kombucha versus drinking just regular tea? Definitely. So um, first of all, normally when we have a cup of tea, we have one tea bag to six to eight ounces of water. When we make kombucha, we do four to six tea bags per gallon. So normally, um, that would look like um, that would be 16 tea bags to a gallon. So we're reducing that quantity already by like about 75%. So you're minimizing caffeine right there. And then just like caffeine stimulates our nervous system, it stimulates the yeast. And so part of it gets metabolized in that fermentation process. More often than not, what people are experiencing is improved digestion. Mm -hmm. Right. Imagine that post Thanksgiving meal with all that food in there. Now you include some, you know, fermented cranberry sauce, some sauerkraut and some kombucha. Yeah. And you're back up off the couch in no time. Right. <laughs> um, and then the other the other part of it is those B vitamins, mm-hmm. from which we know gives our body additional energy. So that's where a lot of that comes. Now, every body is different. And that's what our trust your gut philosophy is all about. It's about listening to the feedback your body's giving you. So if you're drinking a kombucha from the store and you're finding I'm really sensitive to the caffeine. You can make experimental batches with different herbs and tisons, and we're starting to see some of those come on the market. So like hibiscus kombucha um, is one that isn't going to have caffeine present in it, but will still have all that great um, stuff. And that's what's exciting about kombucha is this SCOBY is a technology that's incredibly flexible, and we're just tip of the iceberg here, you know. Um, we haven't seen long bottle aging, right? We, we've got, um, you know, all these different herbs and tisans. People are doing yerba mate kombuchas and, you know, insert herb here kombucha, right? And, yeah. You know, we're going to have a lot of fun with this coffee kombucha people are now making. Right. I've had some of that. It, it's really good when it comes out right. Uh, actually, this, um, this, some of the people listening might remember this, but I spoke a few months ago at Penn State and the person who invited me there she was a listener of the show, and and her name's Tammy, and she's wonderful. So she has a microbiology lab, and when she got into you know this this hippy dippy stuff and started listening to all these things about natural health and biohacking as a microbiologist, she was like, "What's this fermentation stuff?" And when we when we went to her her lab, I. I would guess off the top of my head, she probably laid out like 12 or 15 different things, various ferments from coffee kombucha to cranberry kombucha to, uh, 
you know, various yogurts and raw dairy that was fermented and, and raw cheeses. And we just had this whole smorgasbord and we were lit up after we tried all that stuff. You can really feel it. And it was so much fun to see someone embrace it so much and also help teach other people, uh, including the people, in her, the students in our class, like how easy it is just to set something up and then let it go and let it let it grow. And then a few weeks later, it's ready to be delicious in your mouth. <laughs> You know, who doesn't love delicious in your mouth? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but you know, this is the work that we're all doing. And that's what changing the world one gut at a time is about. I, mm -hmm. sure, I speak Mandarin, Chinese, and Spanish. Little fun fact there. But I'm not going to be able to connect with all 7 billion people on this planet sure. in my lifetime. Yeah. And so the more we teach other people about this and why it's good for them and teach them the process, then they go and they teach someone else. And so right. this, you know, changing the world is about how each of us is empowered to go out and do that. And so it's exciting to see the microbiologists who are who are excited about this, all the people from the Human Microbiome Project. I mean, there's a huge flood of exciting information that's really coming coming to light. And, and you know, I just want to emphasize diversity, though. You know, it's not about mm -hmm. just having kombucha or just having your probiotic drink from the store. You want to also get that sauerkraut. You want to get right. that that yogurt and, you know, all those other different types of fermented foods into your into your body because no one is ever going to provide all the nutrition you need. Right. Um, you probably know from your studies of human and diets and things, you know, humans evolved to consume small amounts of many different things. Right. And that was to prevent toxicity, right? Because who knew if you overconsume something, what kind of effect it would have on you. And so, you know, that what happens when you get rid of all those chemicals off of your tongue is you can taste things again. Yeah. And so now having, you know, some bitters here or some sour there or sweet up here and, you know, salty there, like all of that really has its own language and you can really enjoy food again. Yeah. Now, in your book, you have so many fun fun things in here that, that you can do, not just with kombucha, like you said, but, but various ferments. And I, I don't even know where to get started. What are some of your favorites? Because there's so many in here that I've never seen before. Well, uh, so, well, we really love eating the SCOBY. That's the SCOBY fruit leather. Highly recommend yeah. baby in a blender. <laughs> That's an advanced move that right joke. there. I'll have to try that. <laughs> You mix it with the fruit and then you dehydrate it at a low temperature. It's really good. You wouldn't even know it's not wow. regular fruit leather. Um, some of the other fun things to make the mask and the cream. Uh -huh. right? I'll just even lay a scoby on my face. It won't suck out your brains, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's fun. And then you can, and what's really great for folks who have eczema or extreme inflammation, they'll go ahead and they'll put that in a blender or they'll apply that topically. Mm -hmm. And it really helps to calm that. Uh, from from the external side as well, or even sometimes I'll burn myself, right? I'll accidentally grab a pan or whatever. Mm -hmm. The very first thing I do is I put kombucha on it. Really? And if I can, I throw a scoby. It just minimizes the burn huh. for some reason, and lots of people have had that great experience with it. But, you know, there's people out there who are making it into leather substitutes or trying to turn it into a <laughs> Clothes, fabric. Clothes, right? Yeah. So, yeah, there's been some great research in Australia. They're doing it in Iowa in all kinds of places. And, you know, you have to figure out ways to tan it like yeah. a hide because it's very hydrophilic, meaning it absorbs a lot of water. It'd be like the last <laughs> so it rains and you just turn out. into swamp thing. right? Exactly right. <laughs> But if they tan it, they can figure out a way to make that process feasible. Now you've got a biodegradable material right. that can substitute for, for all these different things. NASA's even taken it out into space with them to wow. see can they use it to generate fibers that then could be used instead of having to carry all the supplies with them. So right. we're really excited to see where these novel uses will end up. You know, there's also been some studies showing it will absorb environmental toxins. So could huh. we conceivably take a bunch of scobies out to an oil spill and soak up all the oil? Right. I mean, I have no sure. idea, right? I'm just throwing crazy ideas out there. But it'd be really fascinating to see how that works. And it's great as compost. My worms love it. They go crazy for it. Mm -hmm. That with the tea, which is really nitrogen rich, you know, you've got it can also be used as animals, animal feed and supplement. Yeah. You know, they need bacteria and healthy things too. SCOBY ends up being a waste product for most people because you just have so much of it. Mm -hmm. Um Chickens fight over it. They don't even know what the heck it is, but they fight over it, right? So clearly there's something on an instinctual level yeah. that they're connecting with that they're sensing, hey, this is something I want in my body. So um, there's been experiments done with chickens and ducks and all, all kinds of things showing that, you know, it's as good or comparable to some of the antibiotics that they are that they're used to prevent disease and to also help boost weight and things like that. Right. Yeah, I remember we had a, a huge 
Scobie in the backyard, and our dog just came. It was probably about the size of a Frisbee, but even thicker. And our dog was just obsessed with it for weeks. And, and she would keep coming back to it, shaking it around. And it was just so much fun to watch. So you, you can tell that animals see or, or feel or taste or, or what have you, that it's something very important. And, uh, and I think that's we get a small taste of that when we take our first sip of, of kombucha or, uh, or any sip. You know, it's, it's something that when I look over the course of my day, it's it's one of the very few things aside from like coffee that I really look forward to and that I have almost every single day. It's uh, it's something that is uh, f- you can feel it and it feels great and it's a wonderful ritual as well. And it, it's a nice thing to share with other people, too. Well, and lots of people, you know, because there's a lot of unknowns around kombucha, there's a lot of fear. So mm-hmm. just, you know, a lot of people are like, well, can I drink too much? Or I've heard I'm only supposed to drink a certain amount. And that's, again, trust your gut in action. Yeah. My husband drinks one to two 32 ounce bottles a day that really works for him and wow. i tell you what he gets sick far less often than i do yeah and i'll have anywhere from zero to 16 ounces some days i just don't have any at all yeah and then i'll notice like huh i haven't had some kombucha i really need some of that mm-hmm. and so it's listening to your body it's not about again following a strict dogma but sure. also because it's a tonic some people prefer to have it you know small amounts one yep. to three times a day mm-hmm. you know it's like an instant vitamin shot or something like that that you're you're giving your body and so for some people that works better for them yeah and and it's also important to notice that we all are different, as you mentioned. And for certain people who have like histamine intolerance or other conditions, it's important to know what you're getting into. Fermented foods definitely are their 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 own game. And for most people, it's awesome. But every once in a while, there's some people who might feel worse from having a bunch of fermented food, right? Yeah, and that's a great point, uh, too. You know, we believe any healthy immune system can enjoy fermented foods without issue. But as we know, there's a lot of people whose immune systems aren't up to speed or are dealing with other issues. And so um, sometimes what that means is instead of kombucha, starting with milk kefir or water kefir because it's a little bit gentler on the system. It's really great for digestion, leaky gut, things like that. And then coming to kombucha later. For some people, like you're saying with the histamine allergy, it may mean no fermented foods at all right now mm-hmm. until a certain amount of healing has been able to occur through other nutrient-dense foods, be that you know bone broths or whatever, to help rebuild um, the gut. And then you can gradually introduce them as you start to feel better. So you know, it is really that biofeedback, listening to your body, and being your own. I mean, right, we don't have the training, we're not doctors, but nobody knows our symptoms, nobody knows what we're feeling more yeah. than we do, right? And we've even heard about, you know, the doctors would say, oh, it's all in your head. And you're like, no, it's not, right. it's yeah. not in my head. I really feel terrible and I can't get off the couch. And so, you know, sometimes it takes the medical community a little while to come around to understanding there are underlying causes here. And I think that's the heart of what we're talking about here. Kombucha goes to the root cause. Yeah. It goes to the root of your organism and it helps the body to heal itself. You know, we never like to say kombucha is doing this, kombucha is doing that. It's yeah. that it brings your body back into balance so your immune system can do what it's supposed to do, which exactly. is take care of you. Exactly. I love it. It's like repopulating your body with the stuff that it desperately needed and didn't get for 20, 30 years. <laughs> exactly right. You know, yeah. and, and to that end, like I was saying with diversity, you know, um, I'm a word nerd. You'll probably see that in the book. They're, they're all everywhere. But one that my husband gifted me and that I really love is common immunity. Common immunity. Mm-hmm. Community. Mm-hmm. We need to hug. We need to kiss. We need to let dogs and babies slobber on us. We need to dig our hands in the dirt. We need contact. Yes, yeah. even the introverts out there. Yeah. But we need, <laughs> especially. We're bacterial sapiens, right? We run on bacteria. They're a big part of the cells that we have. And what do bacteria do in order to protect themselves? They reach out, they connect. Like even the image of the SCOBY, what's happening is they're throwing out these nanofibers of cellulose that bond together and create this lid. And that lid prevents other harmful organisms from colonizing or penetrating the brew or causing contamination. And so when we come back to that imagery of looking at the world through that bacterial lens and we realize that reaching out to people, um, being friendly, having a smile, re-engaging with your community, that's really how we're going to shift what's going on in our society today because it's when we're isolated we're afraid of our neighbors we're not in touch with anyone we're only watching the programming box that that's when we're really in a situation where we feel defenseless because we don't have the strength of those numbers the strength of other people and their energy around us and so you know i really encourage people to 
get into this hobby and then find, is there someone else in your neighborhood who loves it too? You know, to, to allow that to be an entree for making new friends and relationships. And it's great that we have online community, yeah. but it's also even better when we can get out in person, you know, whether that's going to a conference or a show or a community event, there's fermentation festivals happening everywhere. Um, <clears throat> so you want to find what's going on in your community with like minds and like hearts and just connect with those people and plug in. Yeah, I love it. Well, I can't believe it, but we're almost out of time. Uh, but before we go, would you mind telling people, uh, what you're working on next and where they can find you? Absolutely. So, um, you can find us at kombuchacamp.com. That's camp with a K cause I'm cute and clever like that. The big book of kombucha. We just had our six month anniversary. So we're really excited. It's been out um, that long. You can find it all over the interwebs. Kombucha Brewers International, if you're, you know, our industry is made up of home brewers who decide to go commercial. If that's you, if you're feeling the passion to give back to your community in that way, check us out at kombuchabrewers.org. We're doing great things for the industry. And, um, you know, what's next? Research database. Uh, all kinds of uh, new things are going to be rolling out at the Kombucha Camp site, we hope, uh, next spring. So stay tuned and we'll, we'll look forward to keeping you in the loop. Great. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for doing the work that you do. And I love that, that the world has reconnected us many years later and that you're doing so well because y your work is so important and you bring such uh, levity and fun to the process. So thank you so much for that. And I'd love to have you back again soon. Well, thank you. The bacteria in me acknowledged the bacteria in you. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks again for listening to Fat Burning Man. Don't forget, before you go, check out fatburningtribe.com. If you have a question for me that you want answered about how to improve your performance, what to eat for dinner, how to drop fat quickly, how to improve your overall health, or anything else, we answer all of your questions there. So quickly, you can get the first month for just $1 for a limited time. Check it out at fatburningtribe.com. All right, I'll see you there. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Fat Burning Man. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, the podcast app, or wherever else you might be listening to or watching this show. Got a second? Please leave me a quick review on iTunes. I always love hearing from you. And if you think someone else might like and benefit from this free show, please take a second to share it with a friend or with a family member. You can get in touch with me on Twitter at FatBurnMan and Facebook by typing in Abel James or FatBurningMan. Drop me a line anytime. Did you know that I've recorded over 150 episodes of Fat Burning Man, winning four awards in independent media and hitting number one in more than eight countries? And here's some more good news. You can download and listen to every single episode for free. All you have to do is type in fatburningman.com I'll give you a second to type it in fatburningman.com and you'll get all the show notes in video and audio versions for all the past episodes of Fat Burning Man better yet enter your best email at fatburningman.com sign up for my newsletter and I'll even send you a quick start guide to start burning fat right now and a few of our ridiculously tasty recipes as a special thanks for signing up once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now, enter your best email to get your free fat burning download straight to your inbox and make sure that you never miss a show again. This is Abel James signing off. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. Did not include nutrition facts in the dude diet. Well, maybe I don't. Either.